Uh, okay, so I, I had some notes that I wanted to kind of walk through some of the things I learned about AI. Yeah. Um, making Carrier Commander. And um, a lot of this is just, it's available online, but I wanted to kind of relate my experience in a, applying it to programming. Uh, I made Carrier Commander in Game Maker, which is not the most sophisticated engine in the world, but it does have a coding language that's, you know, capable of just about what every scripting language is. GML, is it? GML. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was kind of the overall architecture of your AI. And there are two, not necessarily distinct, but uh, two separate things, which is push and pull. So a push AI is, if you can imagine, one central entity making all of the decisions for smaller entities. So this is typically what you would encounter in a strategy game like StarCraft. Mm -hmm. So in StarCraft, um, you don't want every single Zergling to have a mind of its own, obviously. You need one AI to kind of see the big picture and make strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's push AI. And the way that you would write that is you would create a controller entity or object, which then interacts with all of the smaller entities by sending them commands, uh, maybe changing their state, uh, depends on the game. And then the opposite of push AI is pull AI. So now imagine each entity in the game has its own AI. Um, this is what you'll usually encounter in games like uh, Halo, first-person shooters, games where the characters may not be you know, enacting a master strategy, but just reacting to their environment around them in a simulated, realistic fashion. Yeah, you know, Halo apparently is a really notable example when you look at game AI. It's one which is cited in the Video Game Artificial Intelligence article on Wikipedia. Another one which I noticed, which is an interesting inclusion, is the game Fear. Do you ever play that? I haven't played Fear. It's a really good game. It's a first-person shooter game, which is sort of a horror setting. It's a little bit like you're going inside like a CIA building and it's sort of haunted or something. There's some supernatural kind of stuff going on. And the game is credited with being a very influential, innovative uh, artificial intelligence, which includes a lot of context sensitive behaviors for NPCs, especially mm. enemies who are like gun toting, uh, you know, SWAT type characters. Um, are doing dynamic things like uh, cleverly navigating the environment, finding cover behind tables, which they kick over. Uh, they tip over bookshelves. They open doors. They go through windows. Um, they act in all sorts of unpredictable ways uh, and manipulate the environment. And apparently this use of artificial intelligence and like environmental manipulation has been very influential in a lot of games feature these types of mechanics now. Wow, that's pretty cool. In a lot of games... I remember like a lot of old shooting games, maybe Halo was one to a lesser effect, but they used to include a lot of enemies who would just turn a corner and just wait to be shot. You mm -hmm. know, you just kind of point your crosshairs at a, at a corridor and it's like people just stream out and you're just like shooting one after the other because they all act in such a predictable fashion. That's like my memory of Doom. Yeah. Right. right. Just monsters coming right at you. Right. Right. Um, so it's interesting to see that now it's become pretty much commonplace for... Uh, enemy artificial intelligence in first person or even third person shooter games to respond to the environment in this way. Another one which is similar is Bioshock. Mm. If you've played that, it's a fantastic first person shooter, which also includes a lot of really interesting dynamic uh, NPC AI. Yeah, one of the um, innovations of the Halo AI was the group dynamics of the enemies, which is a function of pool AI, which means each enemy has its own kind of individual AI um, controlling it. Like, but, like cover fire and things like that? Well, like uh, in a, maybe you'd encounter a squadron of enemies and there's a commander. And if you kill the commander, then all the other ones flee. Oh, yeah. Or maybe, um, you know, the opposite. Maybe you, you kill one of them and they, they get enraged. And they have this group dynamic where they react not, not only to you, the player, but also to each other. Which is, which is really interesting. I think in that game, you can also hear them sort of communicating and signaling to each other in some other language. So you may be in some sort of environment and you hear people calling something and they're sort of assembling into different formations to try to take cover to attack you and intelligently cooperating. This was a, over a decade ago, but I'm pretty sure I remember they would call out when they were throwing grenades at you. Yeah. You'd know. Right. Um, so that's push, push versus pull. And of course, these can be combined. 
Uh, to go back to the StarCraft example, there's one push entity controlling all of the enemy players, but when a Zergling gets within attacking range of you, it has its own pull AI that tells it to attack what's right within its little range, right? Oh. So obviously these two can be combined. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was feeding information to your game AI. What does your AI use to perceive? So probably the biggest difference between game AI and real AI is that within the play space of a game, the game AI has access to 100% of the information if you let it. Mm -hmm. Whereas real AI, they might strap a camera and you know a microphone and it now has to interpret all of the sensory data from the environment around it. A game AI is nothing like that. You might try to simulate that effect to simulate a player, but the truth is that inside game AI, um, all of the information can be fed to the AI and it's up to you as the developer to choose um, what to feed it and how to react to that information. So uh, we talked about StarCraft. The StarCraft 1, the, the AI was cheating because obviously the fog of war didn't matter. It knew the location of every single unit that you have and players maybe didn't like that. So StarCraft 2, they simulated um, perception like a, like a player by not feeding the AI all the information. Yeah, because I mean, in StarCraft 1, I don't know if you remember this, but I definitely do. I mean, if you're playing against the artificial intelligence, you're sort of building your base, you're getting your defenses, you're maybe six, seven minutes into the game, all of a sudden there's a rush of Zerglings coming at you, and you're like, what the hell, how could they possibly know where I was? Right, they didn't scout. Exactly. So, I mean, a simple way to program that out is just to make your AI send out scouts, and when the scout encounters a player... Now the AI can see the player, right? You know, yeah, that's one example of like one small adjustment, which has a huge effect in the way artificial intelligence is perceived or the lack of it. So, I mean, this can cover lots of different types of games. Um, if you're making a first person shooter, uh, obviously you can't program all of your enemies to ray trace every single ray of light to see whether or not they saw the player. But you can do a very simple line of sight calculation by drawing a line between them and your player and seeing if it's obstructed. Is it really sight? Is the enemy player really seeing you in the game? No. It's just a very simple ge geometry calculation. Here's a line. Is there anything in between? But it simulates sight. And a lot of game AI works like, game AI works like that by just using basic... Um, equations to simulate player behavior. What's the difference between ray tracing and just having geometric line of sight? So is, is there a difference, I mean, from a player perspective or from a development perspective? Um, from a development perspective, it would be huge because you'd have to, when you play a first person shooter, you're rendering your view on the screen, right? Right. But all the other enemies are not rendering their view. Mm -hmm. So um, that would take a lot of graphical overhead to do. So to, you can shed a lot of that by just doing a real simple line of sight. Whereas um, sometimes they have to do ray tracing in first-person shooters in order to calculate cover fire. I was reading about that recently. Oh, sure. Um, so, so if an enemy wants to hide behind an object, it needs some kind of concept of um, what does the player see? What do I see? How does this object obstruct the vision? Right. And all the senses can be simulated through kind of basic... Functions. So you you see a lot of games, stealth games that use like um, they have audio. Uh, if your footsteps are too loud, if you make if you shoot a gun, you know you alert all the nearby players. Sure. Obviously, they're not hearing it. You just you send out a ping and you say, um, "Here's a radius from the player that if anybody is within that radius, they heard it, right?" And yep. that's a simple way to simulate hearing. And you can do that with smell by leaving little. Uh, tracing entities behind a player. It's probably all the senses you could do. I don't think you could do taste. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe in some other um, planet with uh, non-carbon-based life forms where the enemies can uh, feel you coming, smell you coming. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, a uh, good segue actually, is the um, finite state machines. Yeah, I have no idea what that even is. So... If you have a game, and I think stealth games are probably the best example of this, although in a lot of modern games, um, finite state machines are used to 
give more of a dynamic reaction to your enemies. So an enemy could be in a particular state. Uh, let's let's rewind back to a Goomba in Mario, right? One state. The Goomba walks. When it bumps into something, it turns around. Mm-hmm. Now let's look at a more modern game, Broforce. Yep. Uh, in Broforce, all of the enemies are in the idle state until they first hear or see you. Um, when they first hear or see you, they switch to an alert state. They get a little like red exclamation mark over them or something. Mm-hmm. And then they, they don't know your location at that time. So they've changed from idle state to alert state. And in alert state, they're walking around, they're looking. Uh, if in the alert state, the enemy is able to pinpoint your player location through line of sight, then it switches to attack state. So now the player or the enemy is attacking you. And it, sometimes the enemy will go to a fleeing state. So maybe you you shoot him a few times and that enemy switches state to fleeing. So then it it runs away and maybe it forgets about you and it goes back to idle state. You see these in a lot of these games. So this is a finite state machine. Mm -hmm. That enemy has essentially, you know, four or five different little AIs that it switches between. Right. Based on its mood. Mm -hmm. And the mood is influenced by player input. Player input. And um, you can make really dynamic personalities in games by not only using finite state machines to capture different moods of your enemies, but you can also make your individual enemies different from each other. So maybe one enemy is braver and less likely to flee. Maybe one enemy has super hearing. Right. Um, so those are some great ways to simulate uh, realistic behavior for your AI enemies. Fascinating. You know, I mean, as we get further into these details of AI architecture, push and pull, finite states, etc., it seems more like all of this is sort of an illusion for artificial intelligence, which we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. I wonder how far we are from transitioning from video game artificial intelligence in these sort of paradigms into a state of actual learning. Hmm. Maybe far away. Maybe it's not even a, a relevant question since you know something like finite states creates a perfectly satisfying gameplay experience, which is the whole point of this. In terms of um, you know development resources and also processing overhead, obviously simulating intelligence instead of actually using artificial intelligence is going to be way more efficient to create fun for the player. Sure. So I think we're pretty far off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would seem we are. I think there's only a handful of games that are actually conducting artificial intelligence in the most pure sense, and those are... Uh, generally online competitive multiplayer games. StarCraft II is probably one of those, maybe League of Legends, things like that. So um, so what else is on your list? Yeah, the next thing I wanted to talk about was adaptive AI. Uh, this is where we're getting a little bit closer to real AI. Uh, so in adaptive AI, um, the computer needs to learn from the player, or at least it needs to simulate learning in a realistic fashion you will often see adaptive AI utilized in fighting games because here's an example. You're playing a fighting game and you unleash a combo, right? And it works. And then if it works, then you could just unleash that combo endlessly to the end of the game and win, right? Yeah. That would be no fun. Right. So what they do in a lot of fighting games is it's very simple, but um, the computer will detect if you were repeating the same actions over and over and it will adapt. And so the second or third time you try to throw this combo, it's going to block it, right? So now you have to shift your strategy as a player, which makes the game fun and dynamic. And it simulates playing against a real player who you couldn't just do the same combo over and over again unless you are cheap. (laughs) Yeah, no one likes that. So to program adaptive AI, it's pretty complex. But um, basically what you do is you start recording the player's actions. And if you can record the actions and identify sequences, repeated sequences, then after the second or third time, if the player takes step one and step two, then you can predict step three, right? Right. So adaptive AI is based on sequencing and storing players' previous uh, behaviors to adapt later in the game. Right. Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about pathfinding. Uh, It's not quite AI, but it definitely has to do with controlling your enemies oh yeah i have an interesting pathfinding quip to offer as well what's that 
So have you ever played this game called The Witness? Have you ever heard of it? It's developed by Jonathan Blow, who's the creator of Braid. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, so he's one of the most prominent independent game developers of all time. Braid is widely considered to be one of the top 10 independent games of all time. And he took, I think, five years to make a sequel to it, which is called The Witness, which is a first... Uh, first person sort of puzzle strategy game uh, where you're on an island and you're unlocking all these puzzles to traverse the uh, island landscape. And this game is was cited by Gama Sutra. I'm sure you probably read Gama Sutra a lot. Yeah. It's a really popular game development blog. It has just thousands of great articles on all aspects of game development, including artificial intelligence. One of the interesting articles which I landed upon, which I'll link to in the show notes, is titled Seven Examples of Game Artificial Intelligence That Every Developer Should Study. And one of the examples on this really stood out to me. Most of them were about the sort of things that we've been talking about so far, uh, push and pull mechanics, finite states, adaptive AI, things like that. Uh, basically mechanical functions of enemy NPCs inside games. And one of them was sort of a stark contrast to that. And it was artificial intelligence, or, or rather a set of algorithms, which was made to test walkability in the game. So it's a little bit like pathfinding in that in The Witness, what you're doing is you're in a first person perspective, navigating this island or a series of islands. And what Jonathan Blow wanted to do was to create a smooth and unobtrusive walking experience on the island to make sure that players couldn't get stuck on any objects uh, or trapped in any walls, things like that. So he tasked a programmer named Casey Muratori to improve the player movement code. And mm -hmm. so what he did was he created a set of algorithms uh, which replaced the player and explored the entire island. And as it walked, created nodes and displayed lines atop the uh, the game map, which connected all these, created basically created a network of movement which the player can conduct on the island. And white lines meant walkable, red meant not walkable, and it could basically explore every possible dimension of travel on the island, and it could identify any kind of uh, you know movement issues on the island, like let's say um, you know getting stuck in a door frame or getting stuck on a tree or things like that. And so the development team could quickly identify problems with the movement code or with the level geometry, and then they could refine or improve that code. And they basically automated that process by creating this AI. You know, using nodes is an incredibly powerful way to make simple AI uh, perform the tasks of what appears to be complex AI. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, let's say you have a shooting game, and when you shoot the walls, there's bullet holes. Mm -hmm. uh, a bullet hole in a game is a texture. It's not an object with its own code. It's just a little picture that's applied on the surface of another object. Mm -hmm. So um, bullet holes have very little processing overhead because they, they don't need to be processed beyond creation. So let's say you have an enemy who heard some shots and he walks into a room and you want him to be able to look, are there bullet holes or no? And maybe there's 50 bullet holes on the wall. But you are not going to be able to um, teach your enemy to visually identify bullet holes. Right. I mean, that's the really complex algorithm. So what you do, a, sim a simple way of doing that, is if there's some bullet holes in a room, you just create one invisible node in the room. It's just like an object with no image. The player doesn't know it's there, but oh, it's yeah. there. Hmm. And then whenever the enemy character gets within a certain radius of this node, it flips a trigger, and now the enemy is alert and saw the bullet holes, even though he didn't really see the bullet holes. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, as a player, you're playing the game and you're thinking, oh, he's a person, he has eyes, he can see bullet holes are on the wall. Obviously, from a programmatic sense, none of that is happening since <laughs> there's, not, there's not, you know, you all have to simulate to create this basically grand illusion through using techniques like that. That's interesting to hear. Yeah, so nodes are really powerful, and you can do a lot with that. Um, back to pathfinding. So I wanted to skip the basics because there's a lot out there. Uh, but some of the stuff I had to deal with in Carrier Commander and uh, you might have to deal with in your game is group movement is, is a big deal. Because if, if you have pathfinding and you have five guys and they're all right next to each other and you tell them to walk to a certain place, as a computer, they're going to have no concept of the group dynamic between them, right? They're all going to walk straight there. So you'll have them either bumping into each other or kind of like walking in this really like inorganic fashion 
um, not like a group would. So you, you have to program in group dynamics, and there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, one of them is you can assign a team captain. And I believe this is what StarCraft does, StarCraft Two maybe. So if you set, assign a group of units to go somewhere, um, one unit will take the pathfinding mission, and all of the other units will simply follow that unit. And that creates a kind of organic movement. Mm. Um, that's the team captain method. One of them, one of the methods I had to use in my game is a um, formation. Because in my game, you're deploying aircraft that need to fly in this kind of triangle formation. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, I mean, all these aircraft ha have to have a concept of what planes are right next to them and where they should be in this formation. It's actually pretty complex because the formation is moving and turning. Right. So in my game, what I did was I created a node. You draw a path, and then the, the node just goes along your path. It's an invisible node. And each aircraft knows exactly the distance and angle that it should be from that node. So as the node travels along the path, each aircraft tries to be in its spot. And in that way, I was able to simulate a realistic formation movement pathfinding uh, just using a simple algorithm of a node and like a, a cosine function. Interesting. Are there any resources or repositories for... AI frameworks or bits of AI code that you could integrate into GameMaker? I know that there's a large community of GameMaker creators. Are they doing things like sharing artificial intelligence code bases or snippets, things like that? I mean, within the GameMaker community, uh, GameMaker has built-in pathfinding. That's pretty useful. Um, there are there's a lot of people publishing kind of like their tutorials and stuff. Mm -hmm. The most common thing you see is the finite state machines. A right. lot of people are publishing those. I haven't seen anything really more advanced. I would like to see if anybody else has done the kind of decision grid map that I built for my game in Game Maker. Hmm. What else you got on your list? Anything? We have exhausted my list. Great. So yeah, now that you are, the game is already published on iOS and it's in beta in Google Play. So the AI, I mean, the game is pretty much already done, right? You're just doing bug fixing on Android. Is there anything in the future coming up with Artificial Intelligence and Carrier Commander, or is that pretty much wrapped up? Hmm. I am releasing a big update pretty soon, but I haven't really adjusted the AI. AI. I'm actually really satisfied by the AI in my game. Um, you know, as a player, as a developer and playtester, I've obviously played the game a thousand times, and I'm always delighted that it still surprises me. It makes moves that I don't expect. You know, like I wrote all that code. How is the computer outsmarting me sometimes? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually really satisfied with how it turned out. So I won't be updating that. Uh, I do have some updates coming out. I'm switching the game to a free-to-play model, which I believe we'll probably discuss in an upcoming podcast. Oh, wow. Cool. That's uh, a big change. Yeah. From the premium to the free-to-play model, we can compare kind of the results and downloads and things like that. Yeah. Um, since I bring that up, I should probably mention that every player who purchased the game as a premium game gets the um, in-app unlock game sure. free. Sure. Uh, and that in-app purchase of unlocking the game is um, it's more than what the premium cost is now. So anyone who's already got my game is getting a good deal because everyone else in the future, even though they download the game for free, in order to unlock the full version, is going to have to pay like twice as much. Yeah. There you go. That sounds like fun. Cool. When do you think that's going to be coming out? Well, uh, I'm supposed to wrap it up this week. So uh, maybe the week after that. Uh, this is the end of February. So probably early March. Nice. All right. A lot of people in the CGF group have already been playing Carrier Commander. A number of people have already finished it. Some people have finished it on hard. I think some people have finished it with like 100%, 100 oh, completion on hard. Like the players have gone way beyond what I ever did or thought anyone would do. Completionists, right? They go and they get every star. And I, they'll, they'll message me and be like, this one's not possible. And I'll just say, why? Well, I, I didn't even think anyone would try that. It's just like, <laughs> I didn't think everyone, they try to get every star. That's and then pretty they, much an ideal outcome, right? That's funny that you didn't think of that, but they're like, look, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're scrutinizing it more deeply than you did. Right. Yeah. I mean, the combined man hours of all your players is like exponentially more than 
any amount of testing you as an individual could put into your game. That makes a lot of sense. That's really fascinating to hear, though, still. Do you have any kind of figures on that, like the total playtime across all platforms? Is that information available? Unfortunately, no. I don't do any tracking in the game. My game's 100% offline, so I don't really keep up with what the players are doing. I just get feedback, you know, yeah, emails. That's respectable. That must, that must be a huge number, though. And actually, in our recent podcast, which we recorded, you talked about spending, I think, 2,000 hours developing Carrier Commander just in Game Maker. Right. And uh, the players that beat it, from what I could tell, they spend about four or five hours to beat, like, easy mode. That's a nice length. That's a, that's a hearty length for a mobile game, I will say. That's a good length. Anyway, thank you for joining me for this podcast. I was really looking forward to getting into sort of the weeds, as it were, on the subject of artificial intelligence. This is an area which I don't know much about. Right from the beginning of this podcast, the Pac-Man anecdote I thought was really fascinating and simple. A great way to explain some of the dynamics which are at play here in this subject of conversation. I hope this was informative for listeners. If you guys are interested in learning more about Carrier Commander, you can find it on the iOS App Store or on Google Play just by searching for it. You can also listen to previous podcasts where we go into greater depth on the development of the game itself if you're interested in learning about other areas of that project. Thank you for joining me. Anything else to add? You want to plug your website real quick? From GameToBrain.com. Great.